The goal of this video is to talk about the molecule DNA, also known as deoxyribose nucleic acid. I want to go over the structure basically and then some of the nomenclature typically used when we discuss DNA uh, pertaining to genes and other structures. So DNA is a macromolecule and it's made up of building blocks called nucleotides. DNA has four flavors of nucleotides. They are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Right. The basic structure of a nucleotide, if we look at the overall structure, looks like the following. So here's the overall structure. This component here would be the ribose sugar. This is the phosphate group. And these would be defined as the nitrogenous bases. Okay. To draw a little bit more detail and to give you a little idea of how we named the molecule, uh, I'll just draw it again. Okay, so now after drawing it, one that we name, uh, one thing we do is we actually name the carbons on the ribose sugar itself. So this one is the one prime carbon, this is the two prime carbon. Every time we see a kink, that's a carbon. This is a three prime carbon. This is the four prime carbon. And this is the five prime carbon. So what's really important in terms of DNA is on the five prime carbon, we see the phosphate group. And on the three prime carbon, we see the hydroxyl group. This is important because nucleotides themselves bind to each other or bond to each other to the three prime hydroxyl group and the five prime phosphate group. Also, it's called deoxyribose nucleic acid because this two prime carbon actually has a hydroxyl group removed, so it's deoxy. So it's two deoxyribonucleic acid. What I'm going to do now is draw another nucleotide bonded to this, so you'll see how it's hooked between the three prime carbon and the five prime phosphate group. Okay, what you'll notice is this is a dehydration reaction. So typically what will happen is you'll lose a water molecule. So two hydrogens. And so what you'll end up is basically a phosphate hooked up to this carbon. And now we have it hooked up. The important things to realize here is actually which ends are open free. So if you notice, here's the three prime hydroxyl group. So this would be called the three prime end in terms of nomenclature because that's the open end on this strand. And up here, the phosphate group is open, so this is the five prime end. So as you can see, they're bonded in between, but we have a five prime end open on this end, so this is the five prime end, and this is the three prime end because the hydroxyl group is open on this end. So in terms of nomenclature, we'll typically write strands of DNA in this manner, and we give it a labeling. So we got a five prime end and a three prime end. What this means is this end would correspond to this part, and this three prime end would show the end that's unbound on the three prime hydroxyl end. Okay, also some things that may be familiar to you is we then now call this structure of the sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. This is the sugar backbone, sugar phosphate backbone. And then what you'll see when we start to make two strands of DNA that in the middle of that strand or the latter of the strand are the nitrogenous bases. So the nitrogenous bases will be found in the middle and then the backbone of the helix will be the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate as we move down. 
Okay, what I've drawn is actually a double stranded of DNA because DNA comes in a double stranded nature. So one thing I'll point out here, I've got three nucleotides here. So once again, this is the sugar phosphate backbone going along this end. The five prime end is open, so this is the five prime end. This is a three prime end because the hydroxyl group is free open on this end. And notice what I've done now is the two strands here, so here's the second strand, but notice it's in the opposite direction. So the only way that the nitrogenous bases in the middle can bind to each other is if the bands, if the strands move in opposite directions. And what I mean by that is look at the chemical structure here. So now instead of the five prime being up on this end, the three prime nitroxyl group is on this end and the five prime phosphate is on this end. The two strands are connected with hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. And typically what we see is between the G's and the C's or the guanine and the cytosine, this is what we call a base pair. We have three hydrogen bonds and what happens between an adenine and a thymine in this base pair is two hydrogen bonds. All right. Also, one of the things I want to point out to you is notice all the negatively charged oxygen groups here. This gives the overall charge of DNA in an aqueous type of environment a negative charge. So we can use this property, the charge, the overall charge of the molecule, to do electrophoresis to separate strands or molecules of DNA. These two base pairs are what we call a base pair here. The adenine and the thymine are what we refer to as complementary to each other. So these two bases are complementary to each other. So when you have one strand, because adenines always bind to thymines and guanines always bind to cytosines, we always know it's complementary strand. So the knowledge of one strand allows us to recreate the other strand because of this complementation or complementary binding that occurs. Okay, so reality in a laboratory, you're not going to write out the chemical structure. What's really important in terms of DNA is knowing its alphabet or its code or the sequence of that code. So what I've drawn is typically what you'll see in a laboratory setting. So here is our sequence of nucleotides. By nomenclature, it's always written with five prime to the left and three prime to the right. With this information, if I wanted to recreate the second strand or the complementary strand of the DNA, it would be very easy. The only thing is remember, this would be the three prime end. This would be T, A, C, G, G. And then finally, the five prime end. So here, knowing one strand, once again, always usually written by nomenclature, five prime to three prime, we can recreate the second strand. But do remember that the second strand is opposite or anti-parallel to the first strand. So this would be the three prime end, and here would be our sequence, or its complementary sequence. All right, some other pieces of information that are useful. I'm gonna pick a random position within this strand. And anything that is three prime, to that position or moves in that direction, we would refer to that as downstream. And anything that would be five prime, this would be upstream of that position. So keep in mind, this is a relative, but if we look at this here, this CG is upstream of this CG. Or this CG here is downstream of this CG. So typically of a point of reference, moving towards the three prime end, you're moving downstream. Moving towards the five prime end, you're moving upstream of that position. And bringing our structure back into the picture, one of the things I always note is in terms of the enzymes that copy DNA or typically run along the DNA, uh, nucleic acids can only be added to the three prime end of a new strand. So typically when we look at this strand up here, the enzyme will bind to the three prime end and move along in the five prime direction. This will then allow it when it's adding or copying a strand to then add the nucleotides to the three prime end of the new molecule that is being created of the DNA. So once again, if you're going to add a nucleotide onto a strand of DNA, the nucleotide enzymatically can only be added to the three prime end or added to the three prime hydroxyl group of the growing strand.